Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for those who are attending and the first timers or returners. We're trying to make this difference, so hopefully, different stories for different experiences. Um, now, we're going to introduce. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is Ahmed Al Kubaisi, and uh, that's my second time here doing the special needs uh, uh, iftar. Yeah. So today's topic, we're going to talk about, first of all, our injuries, how we became in wheelchairs, um, and then, of course, how we uh, struggle and endure during Ramadan, and, of course, in our daily life activities outside of Ramadan, within the community and outside the community, especially in the masjid. Um, so typically, uh, for me, back in the last day of Ramadan in 2006, actually, so this would be my 18-year anniversary as in the, in the wheelchair at the end of this Ramadan, um, I fractured... If you want to know, there's anatomy or spinal cord, T4, 5, 6, 7, 8, the thoracic area, basically the chest area where I fractured all my bones and severed my nervous system. And now I, I'm left paralyzed completely uh, chest down. If you want an analogy how that feels, I like to use the comparison of being buried in deep sand up to your chest level. And so you feel like you're trying to move or wiggle your toes, but you're trapped. And that's how it feels. Um, and the effects of the spinal cord injury, I no longer have bladder or bowel control. And so that means I have to use an instrument to help me uh, to relieve myself. Um, and of course, there are a lot of secondary issues with the nervous system. There's a lot of neuropathic pain that I have to deal with, as well with other, uh, other issues like urinary tract infections and um, low in calcium in my bones. Yeah, so me, um, I had my injury also in 2007, and then uh, it's been a, it's been a long journey. But I'm, I'm to be honest, now I'm so happy. I'm so so thankful about the life that I'm living, and um, so my injury was a gunshot um, by American sniper. So I'm from Iraq, and. Um, that was by the end of the war to Iraq, and um, also the the it's only one bullet hit me on my bag and come out from my chest and um, keep me paralyzed. I had a lot of health issue during that time, and but I never give up. I was always pushing forward and trying to improve my life. But was the first goal for me at that time is to leave my country and go somewhere else. Because, um, unfortunately, after the war, or uh, even during the war, when the war starts, um, we start losing medical, uh, in my country, there is no um, health care at all. Uh, or if there is some, it's very, very basic and little. So I decided to take myself away from that environment, and I moved to Jordan uh, at that time, was in 2010. I moved to Jordan, I made that decision by myself, and then um, I, I went out with a lot of health issue from my country and then also made that decision. It wasn't easy at that time to go by myself on the wheelchair. So um, I went, I moved to Jordan, and then I start, you know, here and there looking for a treatment and um, looking for a solution for myself at that time I had a bad sores I don't know if some of you heard of it it's a wound that happened for people with disability and basically what it's close to that is like a wound happened to a diabetic person it's it's the same level so the diabetic person when he got a wound or he got like an injury in his body it's really really hard to heal and sometimes the doctor has to cut some part of his body to, to he be, you know, uh, good. So um, I had that uh, issue at that time. And then I was like, it was something like um, very crazy to me. Like it's uh, having wound with me, having infection most of the time. And it was an easy life and situation to deal with for it by myself. So, alhamdulillah, I was going step by step and fighting here and there to get the treatment that I need. And then um, I wasn't able to get everything I need in Jordan until I 
got the opportunity to come to the U.S. in 2013. So I'm making my story very short and simple. I just want you to go briefly with me about it because it can be very long and very um, uh, full of details. So, and um, I moved to the U.S. in 2013. I started having a lot of difficulty as well, you know, when I moved here. I have no language, different culture, different country, different community. And uh, it, was, it was tough. It was really hard. It was um, like the, the first time for me in the U.S., like when I just arrived here, was the most, I would say, the darkness of my life was right there. Because at that time, I remember I was even afraid of being outside on the public because I'm afraid of the people, um, you know, different, different language, different perspective, and on and on. So I spent a good amount of time in the hospital trying to uh, recover from the bad source that I bring with me from Jordan. Well, basically from Iraq. When I left, it, it was with me. And uh, alhamdulillah, I stay 14 months in the hospital. It was crazy with a very small percentage of benefits. It wasn't like really beneficial for me to spend all that time, but unfortunately it was a, I'm sorry to say, a stupid doctor decision. That's what it is. There is no reason. Anyway, I left the hospital on my own responsibility. I signed the paper to leave the hospital and I um, moved into apartment with a friend and uh, I, I was looking for a plastic surgeon or a specialist that can help me. And I went out through that treatment and I, I believe, and Alhamdulillah, uh, now most of the people that uh, was disagree, which is my close friend, they wasn't agree about my decision, like leaving the hospital and just go looking for a doctor. Now they do understand why I did that after a long time spending on the hospital. So I cover from that. Um, now I'm very independent, um, speaking English after all these, <laughs> it was an easy journey, but, uh, subhanAllah, everything, uh, you know, for, for a reason, it happened for a reason. Now I'm very independent, very mobile in the community. I'm trying my best to help others to give back to the community. And, um, one of them, I believe that, uh, gathering, gathering like that and, uh, I would love to help anybody, you know, even is not with us on the room and like, like an advice or somebody have a situation like mine and wants to talk about specific things, I would be more than happy to help on that. So, Brother Abdullah, you want to move on? I'm sorry, I take too long. <laughs> no, please. It's, uh, the details are important. Um, I, I'm, I know mine was a little brief, but the idea is to know the detail of what's going on with those with special needs and those with disabilities. So on that segue, I'd like to actually explain the differences between what special needs are and the, what a disability is too. A good example to use is the Paralympics versus the Special Olympics. Uh, what it is is that those who are wanting to be an athlete and want to compete with uh, international uh, special needs is usually people with cognitive uh, disabilities. Um, the other category at the Paralympics is people who have you know, things that are disabled underneath the, the, from neck down. Whether if you're quadriplegic, whether your hands are impaired or your legs are impaired, um, typically that's what it consists of. And so, uh, for example, autism can be labeled as a uh, special, um, again, we're a paraplegic, quadriplegic, that's, that's considered a physical disability in, in our lower extremities. So that's what classify what special needs and uh, other disabilities are. Um, and, and then uh, the next segue to that is, um, according to my life as a wheelchair user, um, alhamdulillah, I was able to find a job three years after my injury. And for me, being around others like myself who have special needs or physical disabilities, I find it to be very nurturing and help with my coping uh, during my trials and tribulations because I'm able to see what people can do, what they cannot do, and I can compare with myself what I cannot, cannot do. My first job was working with Bay Area Outreach and Recreational Program. For those who don't know what that is, it's located in Berkeley, and it's a beautiful organization that allows people with disabilities, whether mostly physical disabilities, to participate in wheelchair basketball, kayaking, 
uh, cycling, and much more. There's even a, a program where you can go out in communities with people with disabilities and participate in shows, um, live shows, or music, or et cetera. You can definitely contact me or look it up in BORP uh, on Google to see more about it. But being in that environment, I was able to help people just like me to get on bicycles. Um, I had to measure their, their body parts and see what uh, I can do for them. Some people came in with amputees. Some people came, meaning that they have no legs or arms. Some people who came with um, autistic or severe autistic issues, we had a bike where the parent could be in front and the uh, the and the uh, and this, this child can be in the back. Essentially, what happens is that the parent is controlling the bike, the speed and everything. We can actually have the limbs attached to the bike where the the individual can use their muscles or go with that motion, the cycling motion for them to use the bike, which is a very beautiful sight to see because they're out there, they're, they're away from home, they're bringing the fresh air, being next to the beach. And there is a sense of calm and ease when you're doing that. And that's why uh, when I saw it, I was doing it for four years and I wanted to do it until COVID came, they laid me off. Alhamdulillah, now I work for another agency, it's nonprofit, Afghan Coalition that promotes mental wellness. Um, and the other job I do right now is at Apple. So Alhamdulillah, I'm able to work uh, with this disability. So for those who are employers, please give these people a chance for them to partake in society. They may have certain needs to work. For me, for example, I need extension of my brakes. Um, sitting down is not an easy task. There's a lot of uh, pain that goes along with that. And so I have uh, additional time to take those breaks. And of course, with my inability to use my bladder or bowel, things can happen sometimes. And so I can... The employer, I definitely let them know before they hired me that certain things can happen and I need additional time. And I, they just told me to use it as medical need. Don't be detailed oriented on what and why you need to go. Just tell us that you have a medical emergency and you can take care of it. Both jobs are doing this for me. They're, they're making sure that I have my, my needs to make sure I can function in that work environment. Yeah, work. <laughs> work. SubhanAllah. Um, for me, um, I have worked here and there, um, here in the U.S., and I never, that's probably the first time, uh, Brother Munir, Brother Abdullah, gonna hear it. I never find myself with any uh, of that things. I always look into something, um, I, don't, I don't need to work for a company. I like to be independent, even in work. So, um, I wasn't like really excited of, uh, on holding into work a lot. I worked here and there, but I just work for what it is, for the purpose of work, you know, for income. But I don't work for what I really enjoy and have fun with until, subhanAllah, um, I established my online business. Just a couple days ago, I assigned everything and then now it's, it's published. So, inshallah, now on, I would be working, but all for myself or on my own. So, I'm my own boss. I don't have to uh, do this and that. And, you know, uh, I don't have to look at and think about accommodation in a workplace, which is so very important, as Brother Abdullah said. Um, we do need accommodation in a workplace. So most of the agency do understand our situation and they will, you know, help you the best they can. But that was also an issue for me. And I was like, always, always thinking about business, but um, I wasn't really sure what to do. I tried something here and there. And then I was like, working on a scooters, mobility scooters industry for, a, for a, a short period of time. It's really profitable work, but it's hard. It's need a lot of physical involved in it to let it work. And uh, I wasn't have the financial uh, stability to, you know, to uh, build my, get, I mean, get my own warehouse and get employee and get this and that to get the business run in a, in a, in a better way. So um, I now I'm partnering with a big company. It's been running for decades in um, e-commerce uh, industry. And then mashallah, uh, it's been, it's been great. Uh, I've been under training for like two months and then 
now um, just establish everything. So um, that's that's for me at the moment. And if you are interested in knowing exactly and knowing some details, I can share with you after the presentation. It would be more than happy to share that. Yeah. All right. Now. Um, the next segment will be transportation. Uh, before this meeting started, me and Ahmed have been debating on. Uh, so, in other words, on my way here, I had the wheelchair in the trunk because somebody like myself, my wheelchair is too big, and I'm borrowing someone's car, and I don't want to destroy the interior by trying to put the chair in the car. And so, luckily, I, brother Ahmed, called me, so I didn't need to call for assistance. Brother Munir came and pulled the wheelchair out of the trunk. So, in other words, for those who see somebody at the disabled parking spot needing assistance or perhaps needing assistance, just go ahead and give them an ask whether do you need my help or not. Um, it's also very important to respect the boundaries of the parking lots because these handicapped parking spots are there for a reason. Uh, alhamdulillah, there was none today, uh, but we were able to make do. Um, Usually when we do get out of the car, if someone has a big van, they need that space where it's all white striped on the floor to get out and in. Um, if you do, I know during Ramadan, sometimes those last minute comers need to come in and park last minute. They take up that spot. I won't mention which majlis I've seen. Um, I'm sure it's not this majlis, but with the ones I've been to, um, I was stuck. And who am I to go to the Imam saying, please move this car while everyone's doing their tire away? So a part of me felt uh, guilty to even report it. So I had to just uh, wait till the owner came to get the car. Um, one time I left a note, um, the person never called me back for their feedback. So I stopped doing that as well. But for those who are listening, please be mindful of that parking spot area. Uh, but if I don't have a car, I take BART or train. And I was explaining to Brother uh, Ahmed that one time, I like to sometimes not sit on my chair because the position of this chair is just, it gets too tiresome. I get fatigued. And so switching seats works my other muscles. And so one time on my way home, I took the train. I didn't bother to get up early on time thinking that the person would come down and assist me to get off the train. If you're wondering, there's like usually a lift inside or a ramp. Uh, one time, I was on my chair and they forgot about me, but I had stick my hand outside the door so the door didn't shut. And that's usually a cue for the uh, operator or the conductor to like, oh, there's something wrong. And then they immediately knew what the situation was because they knew I was in the, uh, in the cart. But in this situation, I did not get out of the car. The train forgot about my stop. I was not able to uh, alert the conductor and then I had to go to Great America. And so luckily I had my smartphone and the lady felt so bad she gave me the Uber money to take Uber home. So it was very sweet of her. Uh, for BART, elevators are there. It's very accessible. Sometimes I have to do my research to see if the elevators are operating because some stations require you to get to use the elevator to get out of the station. And so it's be mindful of that. So for parents or, or those with the disabilities, um, utilize those services because it's actually very cheap. Uh, for those who are permanently disabled, you can get a, uh, a regional transit card and the prices from here to, let's say, from Fremont to San Francisco is less than $3. And that's a round trip ticket. So utilize your services. What do you want me to tell you? Your car. Oh, how you <laughs> Yeah. Um, transportation, I had terrible, and so I have a lot of uh, problems with the BART before. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, I haven't used BART from, from a long time. Uh, during the pandemic, I used it for a little bit, but uh, I'm driving, Alhamdulillah. Uh, my car takes me anywhere. Uh, and the thing is like, sometimes as Brother Abdullah said, it's very cheap to use it. So to the city, no, I would take the BART. I would have, I saw, um, kind of like set up myself with, with um, uh, different mobility device. So I have a power chair, I have a scooter. So I have them set down there. So usually when I go to the city, of course it's cheaper for me instead of like hustling on the traffic and, uh, you know, focusing on the way. You just take train, take you the way that you want and enjoy the life over there, finish your things and get back. So um, uh, I, I had a lot of issue with the train before also uh, the, uh, the elevator. So, uh, now on, I mean, not now on, um, a while ago, actually, when I 
usually when I go take when I decided to take the train I just stop by the agent right away and ask if the elevator is uh, working in even not my station even a specific station they can check for me and um, that was that was uh, helpful things because I stuck a couple time in, in a different station and I have to go all around to gate on another uh, side of the train and uh, but now alhamdulillah I'm I'm just driving my car anywhere I, I, I want and uh, there's no issue with that and uh, other things I surprised from brother Abdullah that I was I was telling him that I saw his wheelchair his wheelchair is big I saw it on the trunk but uh, I was like you know even sometime I go for a short ride I need to get something done but I really have to get my wheelchair next to me even I so it's hard it, it, it may seem simple to me now or to you if you see me putting my wheelchair in the car I have to assemble it part completely and put each part differently on my on my read it's not an easy process but I got used to it and it's um, alhamdulillah it's it's I so it's I, I putting effort in it because sometimes if I if I do the movement not in the right way it can hurt my back muscles, my shoulder, can irritate me, like in a second. So uh, I was telling him like to have his chair on his reach in case of an emergency, you never know, you know, you're driving on the way, something could happen. So having a wheelchair on your reach, it can make something safer for you. Yeah, and um, yeah, that's uh, about transportation. I was, I was explaining to Brother Ahmed, if there's a car on fire, do you have time to set up your wheelchair? Or are you going to get out of the car? Uh, he said he's going to set up his wheelchair. Me, I would just roll out of the car and try to go as far away as possible. You won't be far of the car. <laughs> Perhaps. That's, that, that's also the problem. Yeah. Mm. But the wheelchair can take me less than one minute. 50 seconds. 53 seconds exactly, I counted. It can impressive. take me to, to desample my wheelchair. Yeah. yeah, usually the, the cars does matter. The size of the car makes it easier. Um, what I'd like to move forward next is talk about um, Ramadan and how it is for those who are disabled. Um, fortunately, we are pardoned. We don't have to do it. But fortunately, I believe I can do it. And so, alhamdulillah, this Ramadan, I did all but one day. Um, so over the years of 18 years being in the wheelchair, I've learned that I had a lot of urinary tract infections because of my dehydration. Um, and so it usually takes weeks or one week or more to take the antibiotics to the bacteria to go away. And so I've learned that let me take within after two weeks of Ramadan, let me not fast. Um, I'll take this day to nourish my body, hydrate my body too, so I can fast the next day. Because why? The barakah is there, of course. So why do I want to spend 10 days recovering when I know I'm now I know this body? So be true to yourself. Listen to yourself. There are days where I have to break my fast because my legs are just screaming at me uh, or like just telling your body's telling you something um, to explain to how we feel. It's hard to describe. But uh, if you want to know an idea, imagine your hand or foot being asleep, uh, that tingly sensation. That's essentially how maybe, Brother Ahmed, but that's how I feel under, in my lower extremities. And when the tingly is too high, that's a sign of something is wrong. And so these messages is a very uh, a blessing because it's a way for me to communicate with or for me to understand what's going on with my body. Um, a lot of people don't have this sensation. Uh, a friend of mine who I hand cycle with, he's, he says he has, has no sensation whatsoever, whatsoever in his lower extremities. Um, and so, as Brother Ahmed said, that can be a, a source of pressure sores or what would you use? Uh, bed sores. Bed sores. Yeah. yeah, so uh, it's the same thing. There are ways to prevent it. Weight shifts, like you may see, I'm right now sitting on one hand to do one weight shift, so I might switch my body to the other shift. For those who uh, understand, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but for me, uh, Tied away prayer, it's hard to go to the masjid at times because I'm just too fatigued at night. Alhamdulillah, MCC is one of the masjids I know that broadcasts their, uh, their uh, tied away prayers. A part of me loves MCA, Sheikh Jaril cannot compare, uh, but MCC is giving me the opportunity just to tune in, hear what's going on, hear the Imam, and it's 
a gem because I can, I can just partake at home, read the Quran with the Imam and just feel like I belong in the community. Yeah, beautiful. MCC, what we say about it. As much we talk, you know, I'm so, so blessed to be in this place. And I'm sure you all um, having the same feeling here and uh, accessibility for MCC. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. It's, uh, it's, it's great, it's great. We had, we had something on the last year, we, we discussed with me and Brother Abdullah about accessibility for the masjid. But compared to others, it, there is no comparison. MashaAllah, it's everything reachable, people can help. We had some um, discussion about the bathroom and now those bathroom here is open and it's very easy to access. And also we, um, at that, at that time last year, we discussed about our wheelchair. We asked Brother Munir about a special place, you know, to pray on uh, on the pray hall. Like, we, so they can accommodate something for us as a... Uh, we don't need to run all around the masjid with our wheelchairs, which is 100% dirty if we don't take care of them right. So, and then, uh, mashallah, um, last week I discussed with Sister Heather. She's not here. I wish she's here. And um, she was asking me, like, um, what about, like, we were discussing about, like, uh, putting some, um, some mat or plastic bag on the, on the musalla hole that we can just use. I said, why don't I just use uh, a Clorox wipes and before I access or enter the, the, the masjid, I can clean my wheelchair and that make me feel more confident. And, and don't make me feel like guilty, just myself, because I do feel guilty like running out with my wheelchair and just enter the musalla or enter the masjid and use it on the bathroom, everywhere. So and she said, yeah, that's a great. Brother Munir, he's willing to provide um, Clorox wipes. And I, I, I told even Brother Abdullah that would be the best and the easiest way to go with. We don't need something like really, we don't need to do something really difficult. We need things to be easy. And that's what's gonna take from us two minutes outside the masjid when I get out of the car. We, I just wipe my, uh, my tires and I access the, the masjid. And then also using the restroom. After I get out of the restroom, I just have to wipe my tires again. Um, let's go back a little bit about Ramadan because um, some people thinking that um, like we do have to fast, we do have the, 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 the reason why. And then uh, UTI infection, that thing is so very common um, bacteria for people with disability. So subhanAllah, it's been like um, three years, two years, three years, I was not able to fast because the last time I fast, I fast for 10 days continuously and then I got a UTI lay me in the hospital for two weeks. And then that was like horrible. So I got a bacteria resistant, so bacteria that resistant to antibiotics. So my body is not accepting certain kind of antibiotics. So that was something like I really have to think about and take it serious because it's not good. So my immune system is getting very weak. So I said, okay, I can do other things. I can do better, I mean, good things in Ramadan without fasting, you know, so that's what I decided to, to not fast, but try my best to do something better in that specific month, you know, for the community, for people who in needs, and uh, yeah, things like that. Now, outside Ramadan, I like to talk about how it is for, uh, for people with physical disabilities um, in, the prayer, in the prayer hall. Typically, I like to pray off this chair. Again, we sit on this chair for hours on end. And so uh, at one masjid, I actually was laying down on my belly so I can stretch and pray. And at one moment, I was like, wait, I can do it sajda with along the other brothers and sisters as the imam says uh, the, the takbir. And then I had noticed that after, from 18, from 18 years being in a wheelchair, about 10 years ago, when I went to MCA, I was laying down, and it, it just inclined to me to do a sajda with everyone else. And it felt so wonderful to put my head underneath the for, on the forehead as I was uh, praying. Um, the reason being, it was so impactful because uh, one imam, as I was consulting, 
he suggested that if I'm leading prayer, I'm not allowed to lead because if people who are also able could take lead, uh, his his uh, his case was that the the imam has to have his head on the floor. If I'm wanting to lead, I have to have everyone sit with me, and that was, was his uh, consultation. And a part of me did kind of got upset and sad because um, if I have my own family one day, inshallah, um, am I able to lead? You know, these things, these questions come up, and so uh, alhamdulillah, there was at one point where I've noticed that. All my family members were very old and they're all sitting down and I had volunteered, may I lead? And alhamdulillah, they were like, please go ahead. And then for after five years of not leading, I was able to lead for the very first time. Um, so that is something that is very remarkable and uh, and it's nice to see. And so I don't know if we ever saw a congregation of disabled people in the community leading a prayer, but that will be a sight to see one of these days. Um, what I want to share with you guys, um, if anybody here in this room have uh, special needs or have somebody on a wheelchair and, and, you know, feel free, please, to ask any question. We will open uh, a question after uh, this conversation, inshallah, and then feel free to ask any question about anything in your mind. We are very open to anything. Uh, there is nothing to hide. And... Um, uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, benefit you the way that we see or the way that we can, you know, from this uh, uh, gathering, inshallah. I 100% agree. Transparency and sharing your story is very important. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we are not considered special needs. And so when it, hopefully, inshallah, next year we will have a family who has a special need uh, child or a uh, Part member in their family to include themselves in this discussion because again this is for us it's for your community to share for us to share experiences because this is our jihad um, I know the J word can be sometimes taboo but this, this is it um, and so for us ours is our wheelchair being disabled um, special needs is a different category and so um, if anyone likes to share right now feel free to share your experience with the community and those who are listening online not to pressure you but if you liked. Yes. Okay. Can you maybe share your story, Brother Abdullah? Because I think um, uh, Ahmed shared his story about how he was disabled. Maybe you can ah, share yours about how. Okay, so I'll be very, very uh, descriptive. Um, so I had a motorcycle. I bought one because I had uh, no financial means of buying a vehicle. And so I asked my mother and father. They said no. But I was like, but mother, uh, I need to get around. What can I do? I'm taking the train, taking the bus as an able body. I wake up late. I, I, I need to rush. And so she was like, no, you don't have my blessing. So behind her back, I bought her a motorcycle. And I brought it home one, after the day that I bought it, and she was shocked. Till this day, she wishes she slashes the tires, but I'm like, mom, it's nasib. Whatever happened, happened. And so it was the last day of Ramadan. I lied to my mother and father on where I was going. So children, if you're listening, uh, I had this huge guilt in my mind because being on the motorcycle without their blessing, I had to, you know, scheme my way outside the house by taking the bike outside. And so that following morning, it was, again, last day of Ramadan, I went on a group ride with other motorcyclists. It was a group ride for newbie riders, newbie riders to ride in the winding turns area. And so you can imagine it's in the mountain, two-way road, quite dangerous. Alhamdulillah, it was a, for the first hour, it was quite peaceful, calm, but then some of the group members were like, hey, let's ditch this group and let's go tear it up or let's go ride even harder. And so the person in front of me, I was following his line for quite some time. Line meaning I was behind his wheel. Um, SubhanAllah, I don't know what had happened. I just woke up on the floor, uh, checking the time around 10.52. Uh, and next thing you know, I gained consciousness laying on my side. Um, I punctured my lungs, broke my ribs, fractured my wrists, and of course my spinal cord injury got the worst of it. And I had a mild head injury. And so when I woke up, I noticed that I couldn't move anything below my chest. And I was having trouble breathing. Um, and so the person who I was following comes back 
And I noticed him and I recognized him, but I'm like, wait, what's going on? Because for a moment, I felt like I was waking up in some sort of like vacation because you're underneath the tree. It's a beautiful day. But once my mind, my memory came back to me, I noticed the guy and he panics and leaves me there. Um, I had his number, uh, but I deleted it for that reason. So if you're listening or out there, you know, uh, I've. I for, I'm not mad at you. I, there's no reason for me to for, ask for forgiveness or pardon you. Uh, but I hope you're doing okay. Because uh, to leave someone there laying there helplessly, I don't know if they call the ambulance or not. I have no idea. But what had happened was that someone, after a few minutes down, I don't know how long I was just laying there, an off-duty doctor came to my side saying, you're going to be okay. Uh, he, he pointed to me, where's your, uh, where's your ID? I pointed to my wallet. He grabbed my wallet. He said, help is on the way. The ambulance came, they noticed that it was a severe injury, then they grabbed the helicopter saying that, no, we need to transfer him to Stanford and um, get him into surgery. When they, when they admitted me, they brought me a psychologist saying, we need to call your parents. I was like, Astaghfirullah, call my parents? Uh, I wish for death because I didn't want to explain to my parents what had happened for obvious reasons. I told her, please don't tell my parents, I'll be all right. And so she came back again saying, we need to call your parents. I was like, for what? I'm 18 years old. I'm an adult. Please consult with me. She left the room. She came back. It's like, listen, we need to call your parents. At that point, I gave them my parents' phone number. And so the last day of Ramadan, my whole family member was at Stanford. Uh, the first person I saw was my aunt. Uh, at that point, I let loose. I was crying. I was miserable. I was like, auntie, what did I do? I failed my parents. I failed them. I failed them. She was like, wipe your tears away. They're coming in right away. At that moment, I wiped my tears off, and I had a huge smile on my face when I saw my father, who is no longer here in this world. He passed away last year. But his eyes were, everyone's eyes was just red, teary. I, I could tell all the pain that I had caused them, which is why I didn't want to tell them. But at that point, I knew I had to swallow all my grief, all my pain, and just show them my smile. And till that day, my dad talks about it. He's like, it's amazing. Well, when he was alive, he was like, it was amazing to see you that day because we were all crushed. We didn't know how you were. But when they first saw me, I looked 100% okay because I'm just paralyzed from chest down. Everything seemed okay. Uh, but once the doctor had told him, your son may never walk again, his prayer to me was, I hope to, stand, I hope to see you stand on your two feet, which kind of bothered me a lot because I don't think it's possible. I was like, Dad, there's more important things than just being on my two feet, you know, symbolically being on my two feet, like living on my own, being independent, uh, having kids, you know, getting married, you know, graduating college. These are things that I've been wanting to do. I graduate college, and so... If I have a family, we'll see, inshallah. But to this day, my dad, before he passed away, told me that I'm very proud of you. You are able to commit. You took 10 years to graduate college. You didn't give up. Um, so, yeah, he said, he said those last words. However, he said, don't get married. That's one advice that I will share with you. Maybe he's talking from personal experience, but he did say, don't get married. But it's on my to-do list maybe one of these days. But that's what had happened to me. So kids, if you want to buy your motorcycle, know that it's not a matter of if you'll crash, it's a matter of when you'll crash, because you will crash. And if you're wondering, that was my second accident, so I did not learn my first lesson. Wow. Yeah, mashallah. So brother Abdullah, quick question. Uh, after you bought the motorcycle, how, how long and then you crashed? A year later. A year later. Okay. So, I mean, it's not a beginner. It's like you have good experience on everything, but it just, yeah. Allah Qadr wants to happen. Yeah, there, there, the gentleman who left a note on my helmet at campus was like, let's go riding. That's how I met him that day. I had no business being in that road. I needed to be in a closed road, trained to become a better rider to experience those, uh, those slopes because those turns are wide or, or lead, or what's wide and blind. And so, yeah, it was a risk I took, which is why I'm able to speak to you today, because as a motorcycle rider, you know the risks. Again, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yeah, that's really impressing and sad. I'm sorry. 
but I'm sure I'm sure now you you not feel sad anymore I mean you moving up mashallah so um, that that was uh, also a moment for me after my accident I was like the price sad for a short period of time alhamdulillah it was a short period of time because if you hold into it it's not gonna leave you you're just gonna you know bring sadness to yourself to your family to the to the surround which is not good not a good thing so um, my message to the family who has somebody in needs from their kids or you know they have special needs please be patient I know you struggle with them and sometimes like they don't listen to your to your to your you know to your words but be patient everything will be fine inshallah and everything subhanallah that, that's something it really helps me a lot in my life everything happened for a reason just take the good part of it and leave the bad leave it away everything will happen for a reason good things will come on time no matter it's gonna come on time it may need some time but it will come yeah so the, the the wrong decision I made also it's not a motorcycle actually not the accident I I like adventure I like to do outside uh, outdoor activities a lot and then I uh, that was in 2019 I went out into my friend ranch and and I was riding the ATV the uh, the ATV, the four-wheel off-road kind of motorcycle. So that thing is very exciting when you be on it. It's like you just have to be fast. You just have to go upside down. And then unfortunately, I fall from that ATV and I broke my both arm. So yeah, so that was something insane. Like I wake up in the hospital, I cannot move my arm. So I was like, okay, I'm paraplegic, but I'm okay, you know, I'm happy in my life. But now without arm, oh my God. I experienced it very well. It wasn't easy. It was, it was really, really difficult to deal with it. I stayed in the hospital for about like four to six months. I broke my clavicles and um, it wasn't easy, but I believe I was extra too wild at that time. So now I'm very mindful of any decision I need to make. I love outdoor activities. I like to, you know, be in the water, go a fishing trip, fishing boat trip, and do this and that, and jet ski, and any kind of outdoor activities I enjoy doing. But I have to think about it twice, not one time. Not something I just like it, I would just walk into it and go do it. No, you have to think about it carefully does the ATV worth what I spent in the hospital no it does not it's like I don't remember it's like five or seven minutes after I start I, I had the accident so seven minutes of joy caused me something that I didn't think about correctly at that time so I still do crazy things outdoor in a good way though <laughs> but I just have to be careful I have to be mindful of every single things because I don't need to say I wish I don't do it no, I, I, I haven't done it no 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 think about it before you do it and uh, yeah and 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 you know I'm, I'm now blessed of everything I have we have more way, more than we deserve Alhamdulillah most of you mashallah guys are healthy even so we all struggle we have everybody, everybody in this room have his own problem. We struggle, no matter. You're walking, you are good, you are feeling healthy, but probably your mind is like, you stress, you depress, you don't think correctly. So we all have struggled, but we just have to take it easy and be patient with it. The light will come out, inshallah. Inshallah. You know, when I think of the honoring and loving the special needs of people in our community and disabled, I think of the story of the blind man who came to the Prophet awesome. So if you guys know the story, the Prophet awesome was sitting with some very high, uh, noble people of Mecca, and he was trying to convince them to accept Islam. And, uh, and then a blind man came. And the blind man didn't sense this, but the Prophet awesome turned his face and, and kind of frowned because he was focusing on the noble people. He's focusing on the noble people inside the, the congregation uh, there. And then the verse came down, 
and and there's a, the first that we see you know you, you you turned your face around you frowned and the blind man came to you because most of them was trying to go for these noble these rich people but then this person that was was there and then every time Mohammed Sallallahu would see that blind man, he would say, give him his full attention and say, welcome, welcome to the man who my Lord blamed me for. Because Mohammed Sallallahu wasn't, wasn't there for his, his needs. So can you talk a little bit about the culture that we have as a Muslim community and how that impacts you? Because we have the beautiful example of our Prophet Sallallahu but we fall short as, as a culture, as a, as a people. What, what can we do about that? Well, we cannot be plus more than we being a Muslim. Brother Munir asked me last month, I think we were together in the room and he was asking me like, what would you think if you were not born Muslim? Would you go and look at this religion and search it and follow it and be who you are now? The answer was, I don't know. And most likely, I don't think so. So we, number one, we have to be thankful for being Muslim, our community. So uh, mashallah, the beautiful community here, especially in MCC, I've been uh, enjoying taraweeh and iftar uh, during Ramadan. It's just a blessing that we, you know, uh, so for me, I live here by myself and I don't have um, any Muslim community around me where I live. So being in this community, it's just blessing. You be like, okay, I feel that kind of back home, people praying, people say salam, people trying to help you, people to try to, you know, be there for you, and people who I don't know. So it's mashallah, it's just blessing. So we just have to be thankful that we are Muslim, and we have to do our best to help our community and help people who are in needs. Because, you know, we just have to be, so we cannot be strong without that. So all together we'll be strong, inshallah. Yeah. Absolutely. Asking, if you're the community, well, let me go ask to specifically with the culture. Since I'm Afghan, uh, I like to use this example. So during my rehab or uh, my getting, trying to get learning how to live this life in a wheelchair, I had a visitor that came to my mother's home where I was at. She came and saw me. She was like, wow, he does look like there's nothing wrong with him. Um, and so she went out to the community saying, Abdullah's not sick. He's not paralyzed. He looks absolutely fine. SubhanAllah, this, this woman who said that years down the line, she had a stroke. And so half her body became paralyzed. Then she realized what I was going through, unfortunately. I don't know, that, that hit me very hard when I learned that she got a stroke because when I heard how, what she said about me and saying that I had nothing wrong with me, it kind of you know, made me feel some type of way. Um, so that's one example. Another example of how the community can become somewhat uh, not knowing is that I tend to get a lot of questions, what had happened to you? Uh, why are you in the wheelchair? You're so handsome, mashallah. Oh, how can God do this to you? And so usually my response is, is it's God's plan. You know, uh, it was his plan. He was like, no, no. Tell me what had happened, brother. I was like, are you questioning Allah's will? <laughs> and so at that moment, he realized that he was going to get nothing out of me. Um, but sometimes I can read the energy of people. Maybe this, this gentleman here, I didn't want to answer his question. Um, at work, someone came up to me. He was like, what happened to you? I was like, oh, this again. <laughs> um, but at this time, I had the time and patience. I was like, you know, brother, I had a wheelchair accident. He's like, are you married? I was like, oh, why are we talking about this? Uh, no, I'm not married. And then he shared me his story. Uh, he was like, oh, I had a wife. I divorced her. She had cancer. Uh, and then we reunited. We got remarried. And then she passed away. Um, so he was just trying to tell me that enjoy your life. Um, find comfort in life. Um, another uh, how the community can help is... Um, just simply ask us or anybody that you see who has uh, a family need, uh, whether they're disabled or non-disabled, because um, ours is quite visible. You can see our disability. Some of them are invisible, so you don't know whether they have one or not. But just simply ask them, hey, brother, can I help you with something? Is there something I can do for you? Um, for example, uh, when I got out of the car today, uh, I don't know who it was, but a brother was right behind me trying to push me to the masjid. I was like, oh, subhanAllah. I was like, uh, I'd even ask for help and this brother's trying to push me. Um, but this wheelchair is like an extension of my body. So if you're going to touch my wheelchair, 
please ask before you do because I don't know what you're going to do. You know, there's a part of me like, hey, you know, don't touch me. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a sensitive zone. So uh, consent, transparency is very important. Um, so that's my experience with the community. Very insightful. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes before we go for Iftar. If you'd like, just raise your hand. I'll bring your mic over to you if you have any questions for our speakers, inshallah. Mm, very quiet audience, mashallah. Very quiet. Does anyone know about experiences or how, how schools can accommodate your child? Um, our experiences with the school system, with competitive sports, recreational sports, um, outings with the family. You know, there, there's a lot of activities where families can go out now with the ADA Act. There are many bathrooms now where the family can enter and participate, uh, you know, help the child or adult in need. But if you guys have your own experience you'd like to share, any special needs family who'd like to share. Okay. He's hungry for iftar. So uh, I think, Brother Ahmed, could you tell us a little bit about after you were shot in Iraq? The worry, the depression, the grief, the anxiety, these are all, uh, you know, human emotions that we deal with. How did you work with through those emotions? Because Brother Abdullah shared a little bit about it, but could you talk about it? Because you were in probably in Iraq, you were in Jordan, you came to America, you didn't speak the language. That uncertainty, how did you deal with the mental aspect of, of trying to get through all that? Yeah, subhanAllah, after my accident, it was, uh, it was something shocking for me, my family, and all the people who are close to me. So... Um, after that, like, um, I remember the first day that my dad had a textile store at that time. And then, uh, he was waiting for me to go to him to the store. So what I did, I basically just walk from my home down the street to go to my dad's store, which is about like two mile or one and a half mile away from my, my home. So on the way, on the way there. I just crossed the street, I got shot. All I felt at that time is like electricity in all my body. And then I couldn't move anymore. So I wait for the people to come and, you know, help me. I saw a lot of people around me, but they were afraid because of the sniper that shot me is like, you know, they, they don't want to just pop up to me and grab me and take me out. So they were... So I was still on his target zone. So um, they raised a white uh, scarf and then they, you know, jump into me and bring me and then they took me to uh, urgent care. And then the first things I saw is my dad, like, uh, so he was in the, uh, so the urgent care was very close to my dad's job. And, um, and then, you know, my dad heard that Ahmed, Ahmed's being shot. So... He was like, just shocking. Okay, he was waiting for me to come to the store so I can take and he can go do his other things. So, um, subhanAllah, um, I look at my dad on top of me and he was like crying and they told him he will be fine. His, his injury is easy, he's just on his shoulder, which that's where, where it was show. Like, so the, the, the bullet hit me from the bag and comes out from the front from my, from my uh, shoulder. And um, I wasn't think like, oh, I will be a paralyzed or paraplegic or whatever. So I was taking it easy and I will be fine. And alhamdulillah, um, they took me to the uh, general hospital over there of Al Fallujah. And, um, and then I took treatment over there for a couple months. My family over there, they were like, um, after they, they find out that my injury is like, I'm going to be a paraplegic, so I won't be able to walk again. They were shocked. So my mom and dad, like, they were like doing their research, doing their best to find out any country, any region has a treatment for that situation. So they took me to Syria, and from Syria they took me to Jordan to get my treatment. At that time, I wasn't so um, about like eight to nine months after my accident, I completely laying down on the bed. I was like, at that time, I remember, wallah, my dream was to see the sun, to see the light, to breathe a clear air. 
I was like asking my sister, my, please just push my 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 bed. I need to go out. Just put me out on the on the on the on the yard. They were, oh no, your wound is open. It's not good for you. You will be uh, affected and stuff like that. And I was like, oh my god, oh my god. Th so they were. So was one. I one of the things that I remember. I feel like blessed for at that time is like when they transfer me from place to place or from hospital to hospital and take me out from the darkness of the house to the outside to the light for that short period of time like they just transfer me into the ambulance i felt good oh i'm taking a deep breath and that that was that, that was like my dream subhanallah and then after that i start getting better they start pushing me out but i was and under depression, you know, I kind of like believe it or not. I was thinking like it's just a joke, like it's a shot. Why don't I walk again? It's it it shouldn't affect me that much, you know. It's not on my leg, but it's on my spine. So subhanallah, my family tried their best. They took me to Syria, they took me to Jordan looking for a treatment. And then at that time when I was in Syria, I was like a little high-level ab wishing to sit on a wheelchair and just get out and be just just look at the community so uh, at that time in Syria um, I remember uh, there was a Iraqi family they live in upstairs where so upstairs top of our uh, apartment that we rent in, in Syria and the guy that we met his mom he have an old mom and they have a uh, wheelchair for her just in case they need to use it they would use it and then I uh, my dad I asked my dad dad can you please ask him if we can just borrow the chair for one day and then he said oh yeah for sure it's under the stairs so the stairs that go to the apart to their apartment please feel free to use it anytime so my mom and dad at that time so my dad he's a medical assistant so he knew that if I would force myself and just try to sit right away, I would have a very bad feeling. My blood pressure will go low, and I get dizzy. I will, I would be horrible. So he don't want, he don't want to set up me right away to the wheelchair. So every time I need, oh no, just put pillow behind your bag and sit on the, sit on the on the bed. You know, get, train yourself or, you know, create a. a uh, um, just uh, environment for your body before you transfer into the chair. So I was like sick of it. I just need to get out of there. So uh, one day my mom and dad went out to the store and my uncle with me was and uh, I said, can you please bring the wheelchair? Let's try. And he said, Ahmed, you are crazy. I said, please, please. So he bring the wheelchair. I tried, I like, like crazy, I saw the wheelchair, I just need to pop up to it and I just need to get out, I need to, I, 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 I'm sick of being indoor, inside, on the bed all the time after like eight to nine months. So, subhanAllah, he got the wheelchair, he held me, transferred into the wheelchair, so it was a horrible feeling. I wish I have not done it at that time. I was, I have a nausea, my blood pressure, my, my face was yellow and uh, throwing up, excuse me for that. And I was like, I feel miserable, but I did not give up. I said, okay, I have to stay here until my situation get better. And subhanAllah, after like three to five minutes, I started getting better. He cleaned me up, he washed my face and he said, yeah, yeah, just let's surprise your family. You will be fine. Yeah, just stay, just stay on the chair. So he was like a, a very good uh, supportive of me, like motivate me to keep holding to it, you know. So I was, yeah, but at that time I was feel not good. I was feel horrible, miserable. So subhanAllah, moving step after step, like step by step, step by step until I, will, I was able to sit on the wheelchair. So <laughs> I remember until that time, my mom, when she entered the, she yelled and she was crying when she saw me on the wheelchair. How did you get onto that one? 
How did you say, Mom, I want to be outside on the street? So my next step, it was out on the street. So it wasn't easy. SubhanAllah, all these steps, all this moment, it's just in my brain, in my system. But do I feel sorry about it? Do I feel better? No, not anymore. I'm just thankful. I'm happy. I'm, at li I'm trying my best to live my best life as possible in the right way. So, um, Alhamdulillah, since, since my accident, I always say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. And over time, I've learned that if you be thankful, you know, if you just surround your own self with a positive uh, uh, talk, positive memory, you know, just hold on to uh, positivity. Don't hold on to neg ne negativity. And you will be changed. You will be surprised. Like things just change around you from nowhere. And subhanAllah, I try my best always. Even if I'm tired, no, no, I will be fine. No, I'm okay. I'm just, you know, get going, get going. SubhanAllah, even the pain this morning I was having, I wake up, I had a very discomfort pain in my shoulder, my shoulder and my back. So those are very common things because I'm transferring my wheelchair so many times in the car. And then I wear my muscle all the time. So I was, oh my God, how am I going to deal with it today? Why did that happen today? I said, oh, okay, okay. Wake up. No, don't think about it. Just forget about it. And subhanAllah, wallah al -Azim, I forgot about the pain. Just I try, you know, my best. I went out to the sun and tried to be, you know, positive and forget about the pain and just went away. So even the pain, I just, I just learned that one. So if you, please, 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 if you have something negative, as I mentioned earlier, that we all struggle, we all go through a difficult things, but negativity, do not share it with people. For your own self, try to forget about it and just leave it away. Just share happiness, share goodness with people. Because people, when they come to you and walk to you, they don't need to hear your sad and your struggle because they do have enough in their life so they need to look at to to look at the other side they need something better you know input input so anything you li is so uh, you listen even sometime you're listening to some sad talk or something like that you will take it's going to take you to that mood of sadness just try to be positive listen to something good always be positive you know, and share that with your surround and be happy. Yeah. To piggyback on that, protective parents with their, with their child or a special need child or disabled child, um, there's a lot of stress already on the child. Um, they already feel so much as a burden already, but uh, because there's certain things that they used to do that they can no longer do. For example, when the first t day that I came home after my rehab, I had to go up the ramp with assistance to get inside the home. For the bathroom, we had to remove the door. So all these adaptations that we had around the house, it made me very self-conscious. So when I asked my mother, can I please move out of the house so I can become independent to test what I'm capable of doing and what I'm not capable of doing, she was furious. She was like, no, I, I, I make your bed when it's dirty. I wash your clothes when it's dirty. I prepare you the meals. Why do you want to leave? I was like, mother, um, there'll be a time where you won't be here. Um, and then I don't want to wait till that day comes because I don't know how old I will be or how old you will be. So please give me your blessing so I can move out. She said no. Luckily, I have another parent. So I asked my father, father, do I have your blessings? He said, son. You have my blessings. And so fortunately, I, I went to San Dominguez Hills with my beloved uh, brother, Adam, to help me test my limits. And so my mom did not give me her salams when I left, which I understand. Uh, but don't add that extra uh, stress if you, if you cannot, please. Uh, a mother's love is a mother's love. So who am I to say otherwise? So I understand. But uh, just show a little more patience and willingness for your child to challenge themselves. Well, thank you for your insights. Let's give them a round of applause, mashallah. Very beautiful, beautiful. So, um, Brother Ahmad, with your permission, we would love if you can give Azan for Maghrib. Sure. Inshallah. Yeah. So, actually, we'll, uh, if you can go to the prayer hall, so that, because we have a different mic for you, inshallah.
You still have the original sound. And then, Brother Rahim, if you wait, uh, hold your hand up over here. Um, just hold your hand up, Brother Rahim. So over there, he had all your shoes have been transferred to this side of the building, and we're going to help you get to the area that we have set up for uh, iftar, inshallah. So if you want to start making your way over there, inshallah, and we have iftar set up for you. We have dates and water, and we have gifts for all the kids. So we're very excited to continue this part of the program over there. Jazakallah khair. Uh, those that are here for the uh, new Muslim star, that's in the banquet hall. Those that are here for the singles and the other stars, they'll, they'll be in the kindergarten area. So the three different stars going, inshallah. So make sure you find your respective area, and Brother Rahim will and Sister Arjman are here at the side. Jazakallah khair.